today on Dr. Phil. Many reached out to help her. I believed my friend was dying. We would take care of all of her needs. But then they discovered the truth. I lied about having muscular dystrophy and cancer. I bought a wheelchair. She says she's ready to face the people she's betrayed. You gave me these crocodile tears. How dare you? I'm just absolutely disgusted. Knowing she's lost someone to gun violence, you manufacture somebody hunting you down with a gun. That's manipulatively devious. I didn't want to hurt her. You either wanted to hurt her or just didn't care if you did. Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. Get ready to take care of you. All this week, we have been bringing you some of the most bizarre deceptions we've ever heard on Dr. Phil. And today is no exception. Brian, Liz, and Bethany are all ready to face a former friend, Sarah, after learning the truth about her lies. Lies like having terminal cancer and muscular dystrophy, complete with wheelchair. But the deception did not end there. Buckle up, here we go. Sarah was introduced to me as a young woman that was battling breast cancer. Sarah told us that the cancer had progressed to a terminal state. Sarah reached out to me on social media and told me that her treatment was no longer working. I was incredibly touched. Sarah told us she did have a husband, James, as well as a 15-month-old daughter named Bindi. Sarah told me that her initial goal was to do what's called a century ride, three-day ride, and one day is a 100-mile ride. I cycle regularly, and I offered to help her. Sarah came and stayed with us, and we definitely entertained her. We went out on the boat to see the flying fish. We spent most of the daytime riding bikes. Nights, we would sit in our backyard, and Brian would make dinner for us, and Sarah and I would have some really deep talks. I have never seen Sarah without either a cancer scarf on her head or a wig. At one point, she told me that she had a blood transfusion. Another time, Sarah told my wife that she was actually being stalked and being threatened by this girl. Who had uh, extreme affection for her husband, James. Sarah messaged me that the harassing posts had escalated into very detailed threats. The woman told her that she knew how to uh, make Sarah's death look like an accident and hide a body. Sarah must have messaged me a hundred times. The stalker had followed her to the gym, to the supermarket, was driving in front of her home. Supposedly there were police involved and they were trying to capture this person. I told Sarah that you hang up the phone right now and you call the police. As Sarah's stalker story progressed, so did their suspicions. I received a text message from Sarah that said, this stalker has a gun. She's chasing me. I said, just run, run, hide. I was completely freaking out. She told me that she was hiding in the shirt aisle, and that was the last contact I had until she relayed to us that the shooter was in custody. I had doubts that the shooting took place because we couldn't find any news record of it. I believed that my friend, who was dying of terminal cancer, was in a shootout. I was absolutely traumatized. We've got a friend that's in law enforcement, and he was able to confirm that this never happened. After the shooting, I came uh, across a record where Sarah had lost her nursing license in the state of Virginia because she was faking pregnancies. When I read that, every hair on my body stood up. If you can fake a pregnancy, and you can definitely fake a husband and fake having cancer. It also dawned on me that I'd never spoken to James. I said, Sarah, you need to call me. The first thing I said to Sarah, I said, James isn't true. He doesn't exist. And she said no. And I said, Bindi doesn't exist, does she? And she said no. And I said, the shooting certainly never happened. And of course, she said no. Then I asked her, is the cancer real? I said, do you have breast cancer? And she said, I do. Eventually, led me to contact her family, and they confirmed that she does not have cancer. I couldn't believe it. Shock, horror, embarrassment, and betrayal. Why would you want to bring harm to someone who was so kind and so supportive of you? Like, why would you do this to me? It's one thing for Sarah to have taken advantage of my wife and our kindness. It's just horrible that she's reached out to girls that truly are sick, and it's just gut-wrenching to me. Well, thank you guys for being here, and I'll tell you why I think this is such an important story. There are more people that do this kind of thing than you can imagine. It, it's really sad, but it's, it's true, and 
they victimize people that are willing to help, people that open their minds, open their hearts, open their homes, open their wallets. They're, and that's what happened to you, right? 100 percent. Yeah, I, I feel completely violated. I feel preyed upon. I feel stalked by her. I, I mean, I, I'm humiliated. What pulled it at, at y'all's heart when you first got sucked in by this? I thought I had an opportunity to change someone's life for the better. And you say that she sent you photos of a brain scan. She did, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And it showed 13 lesions. 13 lesions on her brain. Right. Which, I mean, that's severe. 13 lesions is pretty good coverage. I think she also knew that we had kind of limited knowledge and experience of the disease, so I just accepted it as the truth. Right. And She's very intelligent. She really did her research. Um, and one thing that she did that I found particularly distressing was she would adopt the stories of other survivors in the organization. So there was a young woman that we knew that had a similar experience. She did have cancer had gone to her brain and she had similar lesions. So yeah. Sarah adopted her story as her own. And she said that she had just really uh, chemotherapy, very aggressive, mm -hmm. and that she had had to have blood transfusions and that she just was scared to death, just paralyzing anxiety about all of this, right? Nonstop. And you say that she just cried about fears of dying and her legacy and leaving her daughter without anyone, that she was just playing the family card, the fear card, the disease card, mm -hmm. everything. She played the entire deck of cards. As I'm talking to you about this now, you seem pained about this now. I mean, I see pain in your face as you're talking about this now. It's incredibly painful. It's incredibly painful. It's, it's you know, she's changed me, who, who I am as a person. You know, I'm now looking at everybody and saying, are you real? Do I believe you? Is what you're, I, I second guess myself. Um, you know, and I've always, I consider one of my good qualities is that I want to help, and I don't know if I want to do anymore. Like, she's robbed me of the one joy in my life, and that was helping other people. And I don't want her to do that to me. Well, next, Sarah claims that she had a husband named James, and then she amped it up by saying she had a stalker who was in love with this husband, James, and the story ended in a shootout. More on that when we come back. <laughs> to create this post, she had to go get dressed up like this. She had to actually create this image for you. It's, it's maniacal. And later, Brian and Liz, you've only ever seen Sarah wearing a wig and a headscarf. Bethany, you've never seen her actually walk. Are you guys ready to see the real Sarah? I absolutely feel stalked and violated by Sarah. I look outside the window probably 100 times a day. It's been an invasion of our, of our privacy, of our uh, personal lives, and a huge uh, lack of trust. It's incredibly upsetting even to me that I find myself now second guessing everybody that I know. You say she made Facebook posts and then she shared photos about her treatment, right? She did. So she had photo evidence here. This wasn't oh, just yeah. a story. Right. And, you know, we look at them here and she's got a head wrap here, blanket, and she's all done going home, uh, feeling drained at Cancer Center. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, now, let's think about this for a minute. This is, she dates this January 22nd, so I want you to think about this. What do you think now when you realize to create this post, she had to go get dressed up like this, put this head wrap on, get a blanket, get everything set up, and either somebody take that picture or set up a timer on a camera and create this illusion of being at a chemo infusion center and, and post that up. She had to, this wasn't like, 
Oh, just something slipped out when I was talking to somebody. She had to actually create this image for you. This is all premeditated. All of it. it, it it's, it's maniacal. I mean, sincerely, who has time for this was my first question. Um, it, it's, it's just sick. It's just sick. Mm -hmm. Next one. Well, it's that time again, infusion day. This is a week later. I braved the sub-zero temps to make it in. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough that she's just having to go through it. Right. It's like walking to school uphill two miles both ways. It's like sub-zero temperatures I've got to go through to get there. February 4th. Heading to Houston for Gamma Knife. Mm -hmm. uh, as always, prayers and positive juju are always appreciated. Uh, then March 5th. So this is my least favorite day of the week, but I'm going to pick myself up so I can kick some cancer blank. Mm -hmm. So here she goes, just like, you know, be proud of me. Get, I mean, just, I'm, I'm courageous. In between all of these posts, she must have messaged me a hundred times a day. Literally a hundred. A hundred times a day. At least a hundred. Mm -hmm. Looking right. for help, support, and she knew that I was going to leave whatever I was doing at that minute to help her, and I would. Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah told Liz and Brian that she had a stalker who was in love with her husband. Now, this is a video message Sarah sent to Liz after claiming she saw her stalker at the gym. I'm not going to let her take this away from me. I'm bigger than that. What did you think about this? I mean, because at this point, your protective juices start kicking in because now you, this is a stalker. We're talking about threats to safety, and she's talking to your wife a hundred times a day. Right. So she's bringing this drama to your door. I know you want to help her, but now she's bringing drama to your door. Yeah. And it's been, you know, sort of twofold there because I also had developed a relationship on, you know, online with her husband. And I've been chatting with him, trying to offer some support, as you know, as you would, and say, hey, if you need a, an ear to talk to, and you know, we, we can have those conversations. So, um, you know, it, it's definitely a very odd thing to be saying, uh, played back, you know, in real time. Yeah, because there were messages between the two of you, because you're trying to do your part and support with him, and these messages, like James, to you, hey man, I know we haven't talked much, but I'm really struggling, right? Some extra support would be awesome. Of course, tell me what's going on. You know, you're saying, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm here. Then I'm doing everything I can possibly think of to make her happy, but I can't compete with you guys in Florida. Well, I'm, I'm happy that she's happy with new people that she's found, but I'm feeling pretty left out right now. So she, through imaginary him is guilt inducing you guys for supporting her right that did make us feel pretty bad there was one weekend that she wanted to come visit us and i said you know you really got to stay home you've been you've been leaving your husband for three weeks in a row now and he's been supporting you 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 need to spend some time with him and we told her one weekend that she absolutely could not come to florida <clears throat> to visit us and that was the weekend that she just couldn't handle not having all of our time, and she created the yeah. shootout. Yeah. You know, I hear in the texture of, of your comments, y you still are talking about him and them almost as though he's real. We believe that, that he was. Right. We said but I mean, now, today. It's, 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 it's very hard to process. I've been having a really hard time since finding us out, moving forward. Really yeah. hard. I said, I don't know what to believe anymore. Here are some messages about the stalker. She's chasing me. Well, where are the cops? Hide. She has a gun. And then radio silence. She knew that you had had a friend shot to death. She just went and reopened the wound. Okay, first off, She's exploiting you totally. She knows this. Because you, you have to, in order, and I'm, I'm saying this for a reason, in, in order for you to unpack all of this, as twisted as it seems, you've got to stand in her shoes for a minute and think about the other side of this equation. Go to her end and think what she's doing. She's saying, okay, 
Now, I've got to message them, so what am I going to do? And she said, okay, I'm going to guilt-induce them on my husband's part, who doesn't exist. So he's going to tell them that he feels left out. Is this to set you up to do some things for him? So she has two portals of... Mm -hmm. Uh, of drain absolutely she set the james you know in motion so that i would be offering him support you were offering him support yeah. and then you know vicariously she was getting that that support so herself. now there's 200 times 100 from you maybe 100 from you she's she's doubling down mm -hmm. by coming up with him and then you're saying hey you need to stay home with him and she said well obviously you don't get it lady <laughs> so we're going to jack this up and so here are some messages between Sarah and Liz about the stalker. Sarah, after me, gun. And you say, you're safe. Cops are on it now. What, what? Phone 1%. Their phone's dying, right? Mm -hmm. So you're safe, okay? She's chasing me. Well, where are the cops? Hide. She has a gun. Mm -hmm. So she's creating this like she's actually in a store, right? Mm -hmm. And her, my phone's dying, so I'm getting ready to leave you twisting here. Mm -hmm. I want drama. <clears throat> I, I want you to... So she's raising it up, 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 where I'm going to leave you not knowing, so you will be suffering, worrying about me. Right. My phone's dying. I'm down to 1%. She's chasing me. There's a gun. The cops aren't here. And then radio silence. Right. What's the payoff? What do you think she's getting out of that? Well, she followed it up with, after this incident, I told her, I said, my gosh, I am so drained. I'm exhausted. I, you called me at that moment. I said, I felt responsible for the outcome of your life. And then she played that for the next two, three days, mm -hmm. knowing that I felt so responsible at that moment. For when you're trained, she... she was grazed by a bullet. <laughs> Obviously, I let her down. Right? She was yeah. grazed by a bullet because yeah. she sent you a photo. She did. And she claims seven people were injured in the shooting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, this, <clears throat> Ryan, was her undoing, right? Yeah. That was... Because now this is a newsworthy event. Right. So now you have the ability to objectively corroborate something. Correct. I, I had a few suspicions along the way, but I'm not going to go to somebody that is undergoing chemo and ask those types of questions. This was a different story. Mm -hmm. Now, she knew, because you had shared this, that you had had a friend shot to death. Yeah, we had talked about that. So knowing that, she plays this gunshot drama out to you, knowing that you had lost someone you cared about to gun violence. So she puts herself in that situation, knowing that that is a relevant, raw situation with you. How do you feel about that now, knowing that she knew that and chose that raw <clears throat> content to exploit you? I'm furious. You know, we had very personal conversations about that shooting, and I told her, you know, how it, how it felt at that time, and and you know, how it was still it was still troubling to me. So she she just went and reopened the wound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, next we're going to meet Bethany, a woman who met Sarah at a camp for people with disabilities. Now, Bethany was Sarah's camp counselor and caregiver. That's next. I was a camp counselor. She was in a power wheelchair. As her caregiver, we would take care of all of her needs. If somebody needs to go to the bathroom, we're going to the bathroom. If they want to shower, we're going to go shower. When I heard the news that Sarah was faking her disability, I absolutely felt betrayed. Well, sadly, Brian and Liz aren't the only two people who say they have felt violated by Sarah's tall tales and lies. Bethany says she also became friends with Sarah, but this time she was in a wheelchair. Uh, they met at a camp for people with disabilities three and a half years ago. Take a look. 
I met Sarah at a camp for adults with disabilities. I was a camp counselor, which also was a dual role as the caregiver. Sarah told me that she had muscular dystrophy. She was in a power wheelchair. The camp is really focused on accepting any disability to be able to come and experience an outdoor lifestyle. There was horseback riding and archery, zip lining. As her caregiver, it was really rewarding to allow her to have those experiences and to see the smiles on her face. We would take care of all of her needs. If somebody needs to go to the bathroom, we're going to the bathroom. If they want to shower, we're gonna go shower. I was the one to change her feminine products multiple times a day. Sarah and I did develop a friendship. I felt like we were very close. When she got home, Sarah and I would have conversations at least once or twice a week for about six months. Sarah signed up for the spring session to go back to camp. She had been telling her family that she was going down to that camp to volunteer. Her family was suspicious because she had done this several other times before and they tried to catch her in those lies. A local pastor found out, contacted the camp to see if she was actually there as a volunteer or if she was there to be a camper. Her family showed up, the pastor showed up to confront her. The camp director helped facilitate that interaction. She got up out of the wheelchair and didn't say anything. When I heard the news that Sarah was faking her disability, there were just tons of anger and um, almost rage that I'd never experienced before. I absolutely felt betrayed. When I found out a couple weeks ago through Brian and Liz that Sarah was saying that she had terminal cancer, I just kind of laughed. It wasn't a shock to me that she's still doing this. This will be the first time that I'm going to see her walk, and this isn't about me, this is about her. I don't think she really realizes how much she's hurting people. Well, Bethany, th thank you for being here, number one, and thank you for what you do in that camp and helping people, number two. That is really a gracious thing for you to do. Um, when you say she doesn't understand how this hurts people, how, how does it hurt people? How did it hurt you? Well, first it violated my trust completely. I mean, if somebody comes into a camp like that and, and says that I have muscular dystrophy or, or a different disease, I'm not going to question that. And now it kind of makes me want to question people that shouldn't have to be questioned. Um, so it was the first violation. And then second, just violating my ability as a caregiver. You know, I was giving 200% of my attention to her. Everything that she wanted me to do was so much more physically involved than any of the other clients that I had dealt with. The things that I had to do for her that week, even down to changing her um, feminine products, you know, that that's something that I, I can't even fathom being in a situation like that to, to ask someone to do that. Do you think she was laughing at you the whole time? You know, that's never really crossed my mind. I just felt like she was so sick and into her lie that she believed the lie herself. This is a woman that the day before camp is walking around. Yeah. And goes and gets a wheelchair and gets in it and rolls in there and pretends all of this the entire time, consciously makes this decision. Yeah. And she asked you for your ultrasound pictures. She did. I was uh, pregnant during that friendship, and she, she kept asking me to see the ultrasound pictures, which at the time I didn't think was weird, but hindsight, doing more research on her and finding out she had stolen other women's ultrasound pictures just is another violation of my trust. How did you finally find out the truth? Was it when the pastor showed up? I wasn't there when that happened. That was the following season. Um, the camp director had called me knowing that her and I were really close and really good friends and just watched her get up out of the wheelchair and walk to the van. So it's been four years and you've never seen her walk? No. Okay. Well, next, she says she's ready to face and apologize to the people that she's lied to and betrayed. But is she really? Will she be fully honest with me? She's here. We're going to meet her next. Around 25, 26 is when I told my first big lie, that I had cancer. The things that I would do to change my look to make my lie believable was like buying wigs. I bought like a wheelchair. I can't remember the last time that I met someone and told them my real truth. Well, I'm here with Bethany, Liz, and Brian. 
They all say they have been victims of Sarah's, well, fabrications is a very kind word. None of them have seen or spoken to her since they discovered she does not have cancer, doesn't have a husband, doesn't have a daughter, doesn't have muscular dystrophy. Here's what Sarah has to say. Watch very carefully. I have a lying addiction. The last eight years, I've done all kinds of extreme measures to make my life seem more exciting. Growing up, you always want to have that perfect life. All my friends were getting married, and it made me feel left out. Around 25, 26 is when I told my first big lie, that I had cancer. I first joined the online support group and met people, and that's when I started living that lie. I would post pictures, stuff like it's treatment day, can I have extra prayers and support. The things that I would do to change my look to make my lie believable was like buying wigs. I bought like a wheelchair. By lying, I was getting attention. Another lie was that I was married. I started off with like a husband and two kids. That was my first husband story lie. I would tell people that my husband's name was James. I would post pictures of me and my ex, or me and my cousin, and then I'd also post pictures of my friend's children with me. I've also lied about having muscular dystrophy. I've worked at a muscular dystrophy camp in the past, so I'm familiar with the people and what their struggles are. It took a lot of mental brain power to keep up the charade. If you're playing hockey and you want to hold the stick and hit the puck, you can't do that. I go into a relationship with a friend on the basis of lies every single time. Talking to Liz online was very personal. I told her I had stage four breast cancer. She was genuinely interested in me. I just had a really strong connection with her. Liz and Brian have like the perfect life. They own their own company with a boat right on the ocean. They kept trying to get James to come down to Florida that obviously he couldn't do because he didn't exist. I thought I could deter them from the James situation by creating a stalker. Maybe that would get them off that tangent. Well, I definitely got out of control. I can't remember the last time that I met someone and told them my real truth. This is ultimately do or die for me. If I can't stop, it's going to wreck my life. Well, Brian and Liz, you've only ever seen Sarah wearing a wig and a headscarf. You've never actually seen her real hair. Bethany, you've never seen her actually walk or be able-bodied. Are you guys ready to see the real Sarah? I don't even know who the real Sarah is, so. Well, let's find out. Let's bring Sarah out now. Sarah, Dr. Phil, have a seat. Uh, you know these three uh, very well, actually. I do. Uh, you've been listening to everything we've been talking about. I have. What do you have to say to these folks? That I am extremely sorry for what I did. I, I didn't, I, just, I didn't mean to hurt you guys the way that I did. Just such a compulsion that I couldn't control. Sarah, it's way more than a compulsion. I mean, even just on that video. You're saying it's just an addiction to lying. This is way bigger and much more sick than just an addiction to lying. I don't even believe a word you're saying. Mm -hmm. I don't. Thank you, I've asked for whatever. So I lied about the cancer, but the love that I had for you guys was like all. all of it again. Terry, you don't understand. You ruined our life. You took me away from my life my family, my other friends, hours, hours, every day. You gave me these crocodile tears of, I've never been able to do this before. I've never been able to cook my own meal. I've never been able to ride a horse. I've never been able to sit in a hammock or be on a swing or do a zip line. And we wanted to give you 500% of that experience. And you took that away from all those other campers as well. It's not even just about us. Mm -hmm. And Sarah, how dare you? Our, our young friend on the West Coast, that is battling stage four breast cancer. How dare you trivialize mm -hmm. her disease and her illness that she struggles for her life every day. Mm, How dare you do that to her? How dare you? I'm just absolutely disgusted. What is it about you makes you so disgusting that people won't have anything to do with you? When 
I ask you a question? Yeah, you can. What do you know about yourself that is not apparent, that makes you know that you need to steal attention, steal affection, steal effort? What is it that you know about yourself that makes you aware that you could never get that by being you? I'm just a really lonely person and I just have a hard time making friends and people have never liked me for who I am in the past. What is it about you? I mean, you, I this, is, this is beyond just I'm lonely. You could go volunteer at this camp. You could have gone to the camp. You could have volunteered at the camp and become part of the peer group of counselors there. But instead, you stole the effort. You stole the compassion. You stole the love and care of these people instead of filling yourself up by giving what you needed the most. What is it about you that you know that makes you so disgusting that people won't have anything to do with you? I don't know. I don't believe that. You, you know something about you that you're hiding from these people because you must know something about you that tells you I've got to steal this because nobody would ever give it to me. Nobody would ever be my friend. I've got to lie to get a friend. What is it you know about yourself? I'm just not a very good friend. I just, I've never had an easy time making friends in the past. And Sarah, just, we, we very quickly, we very quickly became friends. I mean, overnight, we, looking back on this experience at camp, you showed up at camp with half of a suitcase packed with crafts and things that we could do and gifts for us and thanking us. I mean, those are things that genuine friends do. I don't even know if, if that version of you is real because I don't know what's real with you, but I felt like that was how a genuine friend would act. There was a 50-50 relationship there. And so for you to just kind of throw your hands up and say, well, I'm just lonely and I have a hard time making friends, you don't because they trusted you. They opened their home to you multiple times. I was sharing very personal details that I only share with my closest friends. So I don't feel like that's real. I mean, I felt like the, the things that I did say to you guys was genuinely friendship material. Well, right, well, let, me, let me ask about that. Do you consider yourself deviously manipulative? Yes. I mean, you knew she had a friend shot and killed. So you manufacture somebody hunting you down with a gun and then your phone dies so you leave her in suspense knowing she's lost someone to gun violence so you structure a parallel event that's manipulatively devious is it not you did it that is. on purpose yes I you did. wanted to hurt her i didn't want to hurt her i just wanted the attention you either wanted to hurt her or you just didn't care if you did I would never want to hurt her. And I also want to clarify one thing, that we are not friends. We will never be friends. I want you to understand that. Well, Liz says Sarah became so obsessed with her to the point that she started copying everything she did and said. We're going to talk about that next. When I heard that Sarah was in town this past weekend for the triathlon, uh, my heart about skipped a beat. I went to the race and watched and took pictures, honestly, in shock. I really did wonder if her motive for all of this was just to kind of insert herself in my life. Now, from contracting Ebola from a monkey in medical school and being paralyzed after ovarian cyst surgery to catfishing, a disabled friend, Sarah's deceptions have no bounds. Plus, Sarah says she's sorry. But does she even know what that means? Does she even know what that feels like? Well, I have my doubts. Here's a look at what's coming up. Next time, she claimed she had cancer, muscular dystrophy. They were all lies. I cannot be honest with people. You say it is an irresistible impulse. Yes. So you are a total sociopath. No, I don't know. Now she's facing the people she conned. You are a parasitic psychopath. You are worse than cancer. 
you have to pay. That's next time. Sarah's friends obviously feel very betrayed and just want answers. Sarah says she's coming here to come clean about her lies. Well, they've heard all that before. We'll see tomorrow if she finally is ready to tell the truth. You do not want to miss this. For more information about today's episode, log on to drphil.com. We'll be discussing this on all my social platforms. You know where to find me. Scan this flow code to join the Dr. Phil Fanatics. You'll get all new exclusive content and be the first to gain access to Dr. Phil News. Also, we'll chat about episodes and fanatics may receive messages from me. And yes, I do go on there. That is me. It's not somebody writing for me. It's actually me. To scan with your smartphone, just open your camera, aim it at the flow code, zoom in if you need to, and then tap the banner that pops up on your screen. You don't have to push any buttons, just aim it at the code and it does all the work for you. This will link you to exclusive content you can't get anywhere else. Plus, you can follow and subscribe to my podcast, Fill in the Blanks, where I provide critical information on some of the most important issues we're facing today. And check out Robin's podcast, I've Got a Secret with Robin McGraw, where she swaps secrets with thought leaders, innovators, and friends. Get in on the Secret Squad. Listen for free on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll see you tomorrow.
today on Dr. Phil. My brother lives at my mom's house in the same bedroom he lived in in high school. He's 45 years old. His family claims he's lazy. You came out of retirement instead of him working. And a mooch. You'll let him use your car. Yeah, he actually wrecked it. But he says he has a plan. I'm going to go work at a dispensary. A marijuana dispensary? Yes. So you're going to wait for Missouri to change their laws. Today's going to be a changing day in your life. You've never had anybody working harder to bring you to the threshold of change than right now. Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you, thank you. Okay. Now, if you are a parent to a teenager, then you are probably far too familiar with this scene. The disgusting pigsty of a bedroom. I'm not sure a pig would want to be in that bedroom. And despite asking them over and over to clean their room, to do their laundry, it all falls on deaf ears. Oh, and instead of doing homework, Maybe your teen stays up all night playing video games, right? Or texting, or worse, sneaks out to party with friends. Well, today's guest is exactly like that. Except for one minor detail. He's 45 years old. <laughs> this bedroom belongs to him. In fact, it is actually his childhood bedroom in his mother's house. Oh no, there's more. <laughs> Jeff has three children of his own. And according to Jeff's sister, Monica, their 65-year-old mother was forced to come out of retirement to take care of him and raise his family because he can't seem to get going. Take a look. My 45-year-old brother lives a life of a bratty 16-year-old teenager. My brother lives at home at my mom's house in the same bedroom that he lived in in high school. It looks exactly the same. The dresser still has everything on it. I've had all this since I was in high school in my room. He has the same photos on the wall that my mom decorated his room with when we were in high school. He's dressing the way that he did 20 years ago. Pretty much normally what I wear. Whatever he wears, it's just what mom has bought for him. Jeff is the epitome of a 45-year-old loser. Jeff is lazy, he's not motivated, and he's a moocher. Jeff takes advantage of my mom. She lets him do whatever he wants. He comes and goes. He doesn't have to do anything. She allows him to walk all over her. She lets him talk back to her. I know that she is afraid to say things to him. She's a prisoner in her own house. She still makes his meals, cooks, cleans, drives him everywhere, just like when we were kids. The jobs he's had lately have been at a gas station, working at a fast food restaurant, and now working at a pizza place. These are jobs that you would expect of a 17-year-old kid, not a 45-year-old man. When Jeff is at home, he's usually in his room watching TV, playing video games or on his phone, or he's with his friends, like a teenager. Jeff needs to get his life together. He needs to move out of mom's house. Jeff needs a serious wake-up call. Okay, what's going on here? That was pretty hard to hear. Yeah, I would think it's hard to live with. Be around, watch happen. I mean, what? has your brother always been so flat, unmotivated, unable to get in gear? Oh, uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, he doesn't really... It's gotten worse since he's moved, he moved back in 16 years ago into my mom's house. That's a long time for somebody to not say, hey, wait a minute, you're a grown man. You're educated, yeah. you have a skill. He's an aircraft mechanic? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, this guy can make serious money. Yeah, he's a smart guy. Uh, obviously, I mean, th that's a very sophisticated trade and he's got two certifications in aircraft mechanics right mm -hmm. one point he was he was certainly motivated yeah yes you're right i never really thought about it like that like, he's lazy he doesn't want to do anything well do you know what he tells everybody he tells everybody he moved back in to help his mother <laughs> no yeah 
Well, that's no, what he, he says. Not, yeah, he does, did not move back in to help my mom. No, she, if she would be, she'd have a lot more time and be able to relax a lot more if he wasn't there. Yeah, but he doesn't lift a finger when he's there. He doesn't clean Very his little. own room. He no. doesn't help around there. He doesn't, he has two children that are living there with him, right? Two of his kids are still at home, yes. Right, and he doesn't go to their ball games. He doesn't go to their parent-teacher conferences. No. He doesn't do anything. No. No. What, what's his excuse for that? He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to go to any other stuff. I mean, he's just, mom's always done it, so he just lets her do it. His daughter, yes. Tori, yes. says that he is a terrible father and an angry, immature, emotionally unavailable coward. Now, those are her words. She cut him off two weeks ago and says she's done. If he doesn't change, she says enough's enough, too much is too much, and she is at that threshold. Take a look. My dad has been living with my grandmother, and he has been mooching off of her the entire time. Jeff moved me and my brothers into my grandmother's house 16 years ago after my parents' divorce. I refer to my dad as Jeff to other people because he was never the father figure to me. He was more of an older brother. Jeff acts like he's in high school. He does nothing but smoke weed and dress like a teenager with, you know, ruined pants, flannels, beanies every single day. He can't get a meaningful job and he's almost 50. Jeff expects everything to be handed to him in life. Every time I have tried to spend time with Jeff, it seems that he always is asking me for money or a ride or to borrow my vehicle. At one point, my dad was working at a fast food restaurant as a regular crew member, and I was hired on as management, which seemed to upset him very shortly after I was hired. He quit. I feel so terrible for my grandma because she had to come out of retirement just to support us and to see my dad not even try to get a meaningful job, but to continually just take, 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 take while she is working herself to death is ludicrous. I think video games are a good stress relief for me. I am fed up with my father's behavior. There is no excuse for it. He's a grown man. He can't be my grandma's little baby son anymore. If my dad doesn't change, then we're done. Okay, you're fed up, right? Absolutely. What's pushed you over the edge? I'm just tired of him constantly, no matter what I'm going through. You know, I went through a really rough breakup recently and tried to confide in him. I just lost my home and I lost everything that I have. And his response was, you can come stay on my couch if I can use your car tomorrow. And that was his response to me telling him I had nowhere to live. It's I'll like, let you sleep on my couch. I didn't know he had one, but. <laughs> he clearly doesn't. <laughs> so at this point, he's stuck. He is. He's got nowhere to go. He doesn't have experience in the past decade in his field. He's got no you know, meaningful relationships with friends that can actually help him build a reputation and move forward. And he can't even treat his kids with respect, so how are we supposed to help him and be around him? Yeah. And he worked for you for a while. Yeah. Whenever. Didn't like that. Yeah. We uh, were both hired at the same fast food restaurant. He was hired first, and then myself a month later, I was hired immediately into management. We started working together, and he got angry because he couldn't boss me around at work. And he would raise his voice at other employees or myself, and I would tell him, okay, you're, you gotta knock that off. Like, go outside, take a break, and when you come back inside, you better be ready to work, or you can just go home, and I'll do your job for you. And he just ended up quitting because he didn't like me being in charge of him, I guess. You said you didn't think that things were that bad until you got a call from right, Dr. Right. Phil. I honestly didn't realize how bad they were. But we're talking about 16 years. That's four presidents. My mom is an enabler. She has enabled Jeff to continue this lifestyle. She'll do anything for anybody. She hasn't stood up for herself or tried to put him on a better path. Instead, she just gives him whatever he asks for. Jeff's never paid rent. She makes sure he has clothes and shoes and toiletries. She bought him a car, pays his insurance, pays his phone bill. I think my grandma's really scared to lose my dad. 
Well, Janet says her 45-year-old son, Jeff, moved back into his childhood bedroom 16 years ago and has never left. She admits she does just about everything for Jeff because she is incapable of standing up to him and apparently just does not have the word no in her vocabulary. Take a look. I enable my son because I do not like controversy. Jeff is definitely lazy. I just sit in here and watch TV. I've been the one raising my grandsons. Within the last 16 years, I have spent over $100,000 on Jeff and his kids. I believe that he's reverted back to being a high schooler. Jeff didn't have any responsibilities back then. Just take care of himself. For the most part, he was footloose and pants free. He can go stay out all night, go wherever he wants on the weekends, because mom will take care of the kids. His top priority is hanging out with his friends instead of with his kids. Jeff just left. He said he would be back. He never said where he's going. I am still working because I have to support Jeff and his sons. I would love to retire if I wasn't supporting them. It's unfair. I've tried to kick Jeff out of the house, but then I let him stay. I always say yes. Well, you've been listening to everything so far, right? Yeah. What the hell are you thinking? <laughs> well, it wasn't so bad at the beginning. When first four first... or five years? It wasn't so bad when he was screaming at us every day and couldn't even, like, go when a whole you... day without yelling at y'all. Like, that's ridiculous. Yeah. I'm sorry to, like, be so blunt about it, but that is ridiculous. And you say you would like, you would love to retire. Yes. Yeah. And you know that because you've done it before. But then you came out of retirement to start working for him and his children instead of him working. Right, yeah. Do you think you're an enabler? Oh, I know I am. Because, I I, you know, I made a list. You, you, <laughs> you came out of retirement, and so you work full time. <laughs> Jeff and sons live rent free. Uh, you pay all Jeff's bills, you buy all the clothes, food, and a couple of cars, uh, you cook all the meals, clean, does laundry, a hundred grand. He buys weed with the money that you yeah. give him. You know that, right? Yeah. You raise the sons, I mean, football, clubs, doctors, parent-teacher conference, you do all that, right? Mm-hmm. He, what, he's too busy? Yeah, I guess. He just doesn't want to do it. You, you buy all the Christmas and birthday presents, and then you sign his name to them. I do that so they wouldn't. They knew. We all knew. Yeah. It was not a secret, ever. He admitted it to me. Like, he didn't even have any shame in it. It was, oh, yeah, Grandma went and bought you something. I'm not quite sure what it is, but she said it's, you know. What did I get you for Christmas? An electronic year? thing. <laughs> or he'll be like, I'm going to be just as surprised as you are when you open that up in the morning. Do you agree that this needs to change? I agree, yeah. For you and for him. Yes. Because you agree this isn't helping him. No. You know, enabling, that's a, that's a word that gets used so much that it's mm -hmm. lost its meaning. Mm -hmm. But it really boils down to the fact that you're making it possible for him mm -hmm. to do what he's doing, right? which is crippling for him. Yeah, yeah. I need it, to You're making it possible for him to be lazy, to be unmotivated, and you know, that's, that's, a, that's like tripping him up when he's trying to walk. Let's meet Jeff. We're gonna take a break. Jeff says after his dreams of a perfect marriage and family failed, he completely just gave up on life. I didn't know that was an option. Uh, he says he now spends the majority of his time locked in his bedroom playing video games and expects his mom to take care of him. Didn't know that was an option. We're going to meet him after the break. This is where I was in high school. I've been in this room off and on for 20 years. I do not have a car at this moment. I just stay in my room and do nothing. I let Jeff borrow my car for a couple of days. I was out of town celebrating my birthday, my 21st birthday. Jeff told me that he wrecked my vehicle 
hitting a deer. And I had to clean the car out myself after he left it stinking of weed. He originally agreed to pay for the deductible and any damages. I never saw a penny from him directly. My grandmother gave me some money and said that he was going to pay her back, and I don't know if he did or not. Jeff says he's had no choice but to move back into his high school bedroom at his mom's house when his marriage and career completely fell apart 16 years ago. And I guess during that 16 years, he's never had an opportunity to turn things around. He admits that during that time, he's just completely given up. This is my bedroom. This is where I was in high school. Well, I've been in this room off and on for 20 years. It's pretty much the way it was when I was in high school. I do feel like a high school kid again in a way. I'm in the same place I was back in high school. I don't like living at home. I really don't. I can't move out because I don't want to leave my kids here. I haven't been able to get back on my feet. I've tried and it just didn't work out for me. I do not have a car at this moment. Uh, I do, but they're broke down in the driveway. This car's been here about a year. It has a blown engine. Then I haven't had the cash to get a new one. I'd prefer to hang out in my room, but it's driving me crazy staying here. I just stay in my room and do nothing. Watch TV. I play video games on occasion. Uh, now I try to go out at least once or twice a week, and you know, I go hang out with my friends. Every now and then I'll smoke a joint. My mother used to nag me about getting a job all the time, but now that I have one, it's every few often you need to get a better job. She's not happy no matter what I do, it seems like. My mother nags about helping around the house. I feel stuck in my life. This is not what I pictured when I graduated high school. I am tired of living here. I don't want to live here. And I'm just ready to move out. OK, so Jeff, you're an aircraft mechanic by training. Yes, I was. And what did you work on? Um, um, B-52s. B-52s? Yes. Complex airplanes. Yeah, they are pretty complex. I mean, yeah. many uh, different flight systems, but yeah. Right. And so you have two certifications? Mm hmm what, is, what are they? Uh, I have an electronic service certification and I have a mechanics one for aircraft school. Electronics certification for aircraft? Mm hmm Well, congratulations on that. That's, um, I've been a pilot since I was a teenager and I've flown everything from a Piper Tri-Pacer to a Gulfstream. Those are very complex systems that require redundancy and highly sophisticated maintenance because if something goes wrong you can't like pull over and get out right right so that's you must be really proud of that yeah i was was for a long time yeah um when was the last time you used that skill uh probably 20 years ago reckon why you're not doing that i failed the drug test uh-huh so i can't do that now yeah, so you got to be drug free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which if you're drug free, then you can. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would want you to be drug free if you were working on my airplane. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh, but you have the skill set, and that's not easy to learn, so you're obviously intelligent. He's wicked smart. He just refuses to apply himself. Yeah. You said you didn't think that things were that bad until you got a call from right, Dr. Right. Phil. I didn't real. I honestly didn't realize how bad they were. I could get that if we were talking about 16 weeks or even 16 months. Right. But we're talking about 16 years. That's four presidents. Your youngest son has never known anything other than your mom's house, ever. Yeah, that is true. How did that happen? Uh, you know, me and my ex were together for seven years. We uh, having troubles the last three, so we decided to get married, and that made it worse. Um, so we had to get a divorce, and I couldn't afford where I was living at the time, so I had to talk to my father, and he allowed me to move in. Do you think he had any idea that you were going to be there f for going on two decades? No, he didn't. Did I you plan to be there no, for two decades? No, I only planned on being there for a couple of years. 
a couple of years. Well, I, I was way in debt. It's always somebody Take else's me. fault. Like, that's ridiculous. Well, like, hell, take bankruptcy, hit the reset button, and start over. But you don't live with your mother when you're 45. Are you going to live there till you're 65? I mean, what are you, what's your plan? I was waiting on to Missouri to change their laws, and I'm going to go work at a dispensary. We've discussed it many, many times. While you were high. <laughs>Let's talk about how you're living with your mother, because this is pretty much a regression to high school behavior, okay? Because I've talked to the rest of your family. You're the branch. I've talked to the tree. All right. The tree says you have two outfits that your mom bought you, zero hygiene, no doctors, no dentist. You sneak out of the house sneak out of the house for days at a time, just disappear. Your kids are still there for your mom to take care of. You sneak out of the house. When you're there, you just drink Mountain Dew all day and play video games. Yeah, that pretty much sums up. Your bedroom's a disaster. You smoke weed and video games. You watch cartoons, Pokemon. No car, you bum rides. And you reminisce about girls you slept with back in high school and high school level jobs, if any. So you're really functioning pretty much below your capacity, below your level, right? I totally agree with you. Tell me why. Well, uh, after my divorce, I had a problem, real hard time dealing with it. Well, that was 16 years ago. Right, we right. About it. I went back to school and I was about ready to graduate. I had a job interview in Seattle and another one in Galveston. And after I uh, went and did those, came back home, um, my mom and Aunt Linda set me down and said that uh, if I do get the job out of town, they wouldn't let me take the kids with them, with me. Mm -hmm. That's not true. I told you, you can go and get established first, get you a house, check the schools out, and then you could take the kids. That's up. not what you and Aunt Linda said. You well, said you would that's not. not what they, if they did say what you're saying, you're the dad. She doesn't have any legal right. If you wanted to take your kids, even though it wouldn't be the best thing for me. You know I didn't have the kids. money to fight mom and Aunt Linda for custody. Yeah, we think grandma has money to pay for lawyers to fight, fight you over it regardless. That. If you wanted to move away, you could move I would away have had to them. fight them. You know that. Well, she would never fight you. That's the whole problem. She would never let it get to that. She would well, have just let it go. Are you going to live there till you're 65? I mean, what do you, what's your plan, seriously? Do you have a plan? I do have a plan. When, what is it? I was waiting on to Missouri to change their laws, and I'm going to go work with my friend at a dispensary, and uh, I'll move out. At a dispensary? Mm-hmm. What kind of, marijuana dispensary? Yes. So you're going to wait for Missouri to change their laws, because we know... <laughs> Well, they've already changed the law. They just have to give us the guidelines to what, so we can open the store. We're just waiting on the guidelines. We've discussed it many, many times. While you were high. <laughs> well, we were high Because seriously, I'm, I'm just being honest. If yeah. he's hiring you, I'm wondering who he's turning down. Because you haven't had a job in 16 years of anything other than fast food. And you're living with your mother and you're not exactly a fireball, I think it's time to grow up. And sometimes you have to behave your way to success. Um, and boy, do I have just the person to help him after the break. Oh, do I have the person. We'll be right back. Jeff's sister, Monica, wrote in, desperate for my help, and that's interesting to me that Janet didn't write in. Janet's the one that's getting hammered here. She's the one that's got the laboring oar. She's the one raising the children, paying the bills, cleaning up after him, taking care of all the responsibilities, but she didn't ask for help. I have the perfect man to help Jeff become his best self. 
Now, Mike Baer is a very dear friend of mine, and he's a life coach and the CEO of Cast Centers. He's experienced, he's loved by his clients. They include many A-list celebrities who you would think, who, why would they need somebody to jack their lives up? But they do. Uh, they get stuck sometimes as well. Coach Mike focuses on helping his clients break free of destructive patterns that aren't yielding results that they want. And he has a New York Times best-selling book that is called Best Self, Be You Only Better. And when we talk about life coaching, there's an important distinction here, right, Mike? Because when, when life's not working out and things aren't going well, you can go down one path, which is kind of the medical model, where you say, this is psychiatric or, or this is mental illness, and it might require medication, therapy, hospitalization, or whatever. Or there's another path you can go down, which you just say is dysfunctional behavior, and you need to behave your way out of it. That's where we find you is on this behavioral path, correct? That's correct. We, I mean, first things first, let's kind of change our posture. Just sit up. I want to know from you, why would we take you on as a client? To help you improve your life, why would we take you on? Because uh, I want to change my life. I don't want to be where I'm at right now. I I'm just don't know how to do it. And you're willing to go to any length to do it? Whatever I need to do. I mean, seriously, you want out of this, right? Yeah. Well, you don't. Well, just you don't like this. No, I don't like it at all. I mean, there's, there's no way you, you like this. You're not a good role model for your children. You, you have to feel guilty for burdening your mother the way that you are. And you, your life's not working. I mean, he's, he's given us some excuses here for stuck life. According to Jeff, he divorced and got fired from his job, so he lost momentum there. Uh, he says his mother treats him like a child. That's mutually defined. It says he can't move and can't find a job. He says mom stopped him from his dream job in Seattle. He's not interested in any of the jobs in his area. It's too cold. Jobs here use old dirty grease. Now, according to Tori and Monica and Janet, he blames Janet for not giving him money for a third aviation degree. He won't go to therapy because they're afraid they're gonna tell him it's his fault. He believes his family's out to get him and his father was tough on him and didn't teach him how to be a dad. The whole description I see right here is what I say with clients. We call it the wambulance that you're waiting to pick you up, right? It's not coming, or it's here now. So let's talk about inertia, because that's what we're dealing with here, right? I mean, it's just a lack of movement or activity, and it's a property of matter by which it remains at rest unless acted upon by some external force. Okay. Meet external force. <laughs> okay? And... So we've got to overcome this. Something's got to shake you out of this, and that's what you're intending to do, right? Well, we would start 7 a.m., you're out of the house, 6 p.m., you're home. Mom's going to lock the door. He's not allowed home. Your video game system's getting turned in. Your TV's getting turned in. You're saying you're willing to go in any lengths, right? So sometimes we have to make a huge, drastic change in our lives. It's all on me, I know. Winners do things losers don't want to do. It's just that simple. Lo winners do things losers don't want to do. They get up in the morning, they go out and do things that losers don't want to do. Losers want to lay around in bed. Winners get up and go do something. It's, start to, it's time to start behaving like a winner. If you want to be a winner, behave like a winner. It's not fake it till you make it, it's behave your way to success. Uh, we got to take a break. Next, Tori says her dad has major anger issues and is constantly yelling and screaming at her younger brothers. She says it's gotten so bad that she had to call Department of Child and Family Services on her own father. We're going to talk about that after the break, and I have a good sneaking suspicion about why that anger is there. We'll be right back. My brother is not a good dad. You want to say something, beat it out. My mom takes the kids to any of their activities, school, sports, Boy Scouts. Jeff and Tori's relationship is toxic. If they do talk, it's arguing and fighting. It's not a normal father-daughter relationship. My whole life, he made me feel like I wasn't good enough for him. 
My dad's relationship with my younger brothers is incredibly strained. Tyler and Cody are scared of my dad. Both of them, on separate occasions, have told me that they think he hates them and that they hate him too. Well, Tori says even though her dad lives in the same house for the past 16 years, he just ignores his children. He's refused to be part of their lives. His mother takes over that role. You're going to break this into categories, right? You're, you're setting up goals in different categories. We are. You have not been showing up as a dad. I know that. And, and you're going to start showing up as a dad. And what does that look like to you? Just doing more things with my kids, you know, being a part of their life. What type of dad are you looking for? I'm looking for someone that's supportive, that actually wants to listen when I've got something going on. Somebody that cares about what I did that day, you know? Doesn't have to be something spectacular, but I'd like you to at least check in and say, hey, how was your day? How have you been doing? Without, by the end of the conversation, you asking me to come pick you up or to give you money or let you borrow my vehicle. Because I just feel like all you want to do when you interact with me is take, take, take. And instead of being genuinely interested, you just want something from me every single time. You want something from me. It can never go from, hey, I'm so glad you had a good day. Let's talk tomorrow. It's, oh, hey, that sounds cool. Well, my friend's got weed out, you know, a couple streets over from you. You want to come pick me up and take me out there? I'll find my own ride home. I know I'm not a good dad. And I don't want to be. But why not? You've had every opportunity because you haven't been working. So you've had time to be really so hands-on, you could have coached their teams, you, you could have been at their schools, you, you could have been so involved as a father because of the time you've had, but instead you've totally unplugged. Why? I don't know, I guess I just got depressed. I don't know what else it could have been. I just checked out and I don't know why. We know in order for this to change, we have to get rid of, right? Me. <laughs> and as long as you're still doing what you're doing, yeah. you know, there's only two things that motivate people to change, pain and consequences. Consequences if they don't change, and emotional pain or physical pain. And what I want to do for you is also help you in this. I want to get you a coach. I want someone to focus working on with you daily. Because unless you change, Jeff's going to have a really hard time changing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you two have become a unit, and it's a very dysfunctional unit. Right. And we're going to talk about what that new unit needs to look like right after the break. Okay, Coach Mike is with us, and we're back with Monica, who wrote in. Jeff is here with his mother, Janet, and his daughter, Tori. And, you know, Mike, here, here's what I'm looking for out of out of you and your, and your coaching team. Mm -hmm. I, I want to start out with a to-do list for each of them and a not-do list for each of them. There are some behaviors that need to be eliminated mm -hmm. and there are some new behaviors that need to be introduced. New behaviors like getting up, getting a shower, getting dressed, getting out of the house, getting on a bus, riding down to wherever is the target for that day, looking for jobs, <laughs> uh, going to the airport, doing whatever is necessary to make sure all certifications are current, doing whatever he has to do. Those are some of the things on the to-do list. And then the activities of daily living that you were talking about, the to-do list needs to include things like cleaning up the environment, cleaning up that room, cleaning up his relationship with the children, being honest with them. Uh, if it involves getting involved with a therapist, I'll be happy to provide that. There are a lot of things on the to-do list. And then the don't-do list are just as important because you've gotten to the point that you've actually become abusive with your children. You yell at them. You've been anything but patient with your sons, correct? That's that anger true. boils out with them. Right. They didn't right. do anything to deserve that. That has to stop. And then the same thing is true with you. You have to come up with a new set of rules to live by here. Right. And this is going to set you free. Hopefully. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you have to decide that you're not helping him. You may think that you're doing this to help him, 
but you're not. Okay. You're doing this to make yourself feel better. Because at least you say, well, I can't, I don't want him on the street. I can't have my grandchildren on the street. So you're doing this to make yourself feel better. And you're doing it at the expense of him because necessity is a mother of invention. And he has no need to change because of what you're doing. Okay. Take that soft place to fall away from him and he will do better. Give yourself a break. This stuff about he lives in your house and won't even clean up after himself? Are you kidding me? Change the locks on the house. I often find it's harder for someone like you to change than your son to change. This is what you mean when you say best self. He's not being his best self. She's not being her best self. And that's what you're talking about. And you're going to assign a coach to her. I am. And a coach to him. Both. You're going to oversee them both. They're going to interact with each other, these two coaches. Correct. And we're going to behave our way to success with a plan set against a timeline. And you're going to check in and make sure what's going on here. Oh, we're right? going to be all over you. <laughs> Both of you. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah. Also, one more requirement that for us to work with you is there'll be drug testing at the house and he can't smoke marijuana. You can smoke marijuana when you leave. And not a mom's house. You looked a little concerned. Uh, I'm not concerned. You're okay with that? Yeah. Okay. All right. I want to thank my guests today. A special thanks to Coach Mike Bear uh, and Cass Sinners uh, for providing these coaches that are going to get directly involved. His New York Times best-selling book is Best Self, Be You Only Better. You can get Mike Bear's book at Walmart and Walmart.com. And guess what? The entire audience is going home with their own copy. This is a really good book, and I promise you, you will, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to read the book, and then you're going to give it to somebody else that you love to read, because this is a very down-to-earth, action-oriented book. I particularly like the foreword in this book. Um, <laughs> before I say goodbye, I want to remind you to subscribe to my podcast. It's called Fill in the Blanks. That's P-H-I-L in the blanks. You can... Uh, you can get it anywhere you can find podcasts. I get a chance to talk to people that I find really interesting in a fun and entertaining way. It's completely different than what you see here on the show, and I think it's going to give us a chance to share some time together in a really different way that's going to be both entertaining and informative. This is free, uh, so all you got to do is push the subscribe button. You can listen to it audio when you're driving, walking, hanging out of the house. Not you. Uh, whatever. <laughs> and you can find more information about my podcast at fillintheblanks.com. Also, I have a new podcast series, Analysis of Murder by Dr. Phil. And the first installment is called The Killer Thorn of Gypsy Rose. Don't forget, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you next time.
today on Dr. Phil. Is someone hacking their devices? We got the Russians involved here for God's sake. Who is she the hacker? She's lying to me and she's lying to you. I'm not lying to you. I came here because I needed your help. So what are you saying? Because I don't believe you that I'm not helping you? I know that you're the one that's doing this. Dr. Phil? I just want to know why. They left the stage. And just when you thought it couldn't get stranger. You're back. Will she finally come clean? So was there a hacker or were you the hacker? Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. Jennifer and her husband Billy. Now Jennifer says their marriage is in shambles because her family has been getting targeted by hackers for the last year and a half. But Billy says he has evidence that leads back to his wife's phone proving she is the hacker. Now Jennifer was so adamant that someone else, an ex, a family member, Billy, maybe even the Russians could be responsible. But I didn't believe one word Jennifer had to say, and I gave her chance after chance to come clean. Here's what happened yesterday. There is no doubt in my mind. I am being hacked. From the time Billy picked up my phone, it has changed our entire lot. Why was he looking at your phone? There were some trust issues. A friend told him you were getting ready to run away with another man. The more I found, the more she lied, the more she lied, the harder I looked. It's lies. But were my lies of anything bad? It doesn't matter. Really? What do you mean by hacked? Someone that is doing this that is not me. If you're not the hacker, who's doing this? I have questioned ex-boyfriends, family members. You said at one point you actually think it could be the Russians. I believe that there's something that is a larger deal with this. Dr. Phil, here's the deal. I told Billy I did do this, I did do that, and that was one of the largest mistakes I could have ever made. So you confessed? Well, it was a false confession. She would never take her first confession back if she felt that way. She was sure it wouldn't have gave me a second confession, a third confession, a fourth confession, a fifth confession, every not time they change. Willing. But okay. you lied from day one. This is not nearly as complex and fuzzy as it seems to be. Do you want to be transparent about everything that's going on here? I was transparent for four and a half months with you. That There's seems... no way you were okay, transparent. So hang on. Have you been telling me the truth ever since you got here? I have not lied to you. Billy didn't know that I had lied to him to save our marriage. Five it's, times, Dr. Phil. I flip-flop back and forth Five between times. us. Me. I do want to be transparent. Okay, then you need to talk to me. Yes, I reached out to a private investigator. And what did he conclude? It cost me $2,000 to find out that she's doing it. <laughs> did you have 35 email accounts? Time yes. out. Nope, 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 nope. Dr. Phil, we deleted 50 accounts 10 years ago. Why do you need multiple email accounts? There was a lot of times that I couldn't remember what they it's were to get stuff. back. Stop. Did somebody slip up and write stupid on my forehead? Well, no, no, look at me. You know that Jennifer knows you know. how to I don't know. OK, listen, if you just want to blow smoke up his ass, you don't need me here to do that. Because every time I turn around, you're looking at him and saying, now, Billy, you know. Now, Billy, you know. Billy, you know. If you want to do that, you don't need me here for that. Jennifer claims that she took a polygraph to prove her innocence. I was angry for being accused, so I set up a polygraph and had the examiner ask the questions the way Billy wanted them worded. Jennifer told me she was able to talk to the instructor about what questions to ask and how to ask them. The polygraph uh, examiner had asked me four or five questions, and there was only one that I answered that made the test results come up inconclusive. 
he said, if it weren't for that one question, I would have passed with flying colors. If she passed, either she has had extensive training or he's not a very good polygraph examiner. Well, we asked her for a copy of the results, of course, because we wanted to see them, wanted to see what was asked, see what the results were. She said, sure, she would get those for us, but like, she never did. Whenever I tried to send the email, it's not sending through, and plus, um, my email is completely off of my phone this morning. There's a lot of things, Dr. Phil, that are not adding up. I'm on the same that, network in California as I am in but Oklahoma. But here's the problem. Billy doesn't understand that I'm not this big boat that is, like, making waves around him. We haven't moved on from the polygraph yet. Uh, I, you did, because you want to change the subject. No, I'm but sorry. Uh, we whenever, asked you about the polygraph. Right. We've been talking to you I for days, not just to, this morning. No, and you I said agree. you would get us the polygraph results, yes, and you never did. He they emailed an extra hundred dollars and told me that... It, in order for me to have the results, we would have had to have done an extra hundred dollars for the um, something. <laughs> there was a, a written report for an extra hundred dollars, and when we did this a year ago, over a year ago, we did not pay for the extra. We didn't never thought that. Dad was supposed to pay for it. I ended up paying for it. We would have never thought that we would have needed. Why did you tell us you would give us the polygraph results? It was just the questions. We, we when you did not We weren't. We just wanted to know the questions and answers, and we never they, got them. The answers were not a part of it because we did not pay for the extra $100 to have a written deal Why did you it. tell us you were going to give it to us? Well, I fully planned on it. I, I, for, I, was, I did not remember that we did not have a written uh, results from it. I didn't talk to the examiner until... Like You're missing years. the point. I got the point, Doctor. What's the point? The point is that she's lying. The what? The point is that she told us, "I'm going to get you that." She's lying. And no, failed to deliver. And you separated. It. You know, you have to understand that we have to fill that in negatively when you have something and you say you're going to get it for us and then you don't. We have to assume that it's because you don't want us to see it. If I can get to my email, you can have that. I can't get to my email. It's not sending. Half of my stuff wasn't even sending. And you know, it, it, Billy knows this. Billy knows it wasn't sending. And none of my... Uh, okay, let me stop, 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 stop for a second. Uh, hang, hang on. Look, I just need to be real honest with you about something here. You have to understand that I've been doing this for 45 years. I am trained in forensic psychology <laughs> as well as clinical psychology and behavioral medicine. And forensic psychology is psychology in the law. I've worked with local, state, and federal law enforcement in training and interrogation techniques, deception detection, and getting to the truth. The techniques that are used at Homeland Security, FBI, and there are a whole set of deception tech deception detection that people don't know about. And you're just throwing up red flags every time you open your mouth. Like I just asked you about the polygraph and you said, well, my phone didn't send but then you did what is called a convincing statement. A convincing statement, you said, Billy knows, Billy knows. I mean, it's like if you, if you ask somebody, did you steal the petty cash from the office here? Instead of saying no, they'll say, 
Oh, everybody knows I'm the most honest person here. I give more money than was stolen when it comes around to donations at the office. Ask anybody. They give a convincing statement to convince you of something, but they're not responsive to the question. Your response was, Billy knows that things aren't standing. Billy knows this. Billy knows that. You're using him to validate what you're trying to convince me of. I have sat and listened to him tell me this whole entire time that there is not one person that would believe my story. You're oh, so busy trying to make sure you have him on the line that so you're just ignoring me. I'm not ignoring you. I'm I listening. would if I were you. But I needed your help. To you're prove getting it. That I didn't do this. And later. It's your last chance, Jennifer. You better get busy. You better get to talking. That is the whole reason I came to this show. Because we came you to the show because you're going to finally confess four, and tell me what the hell was going on. Obviously not. Half so half so we came here for nothing. One thing you know for sure when you're talking to somebody and they're telling you a story, whenever they say, honestly, or I swear to God, the next thing out of their mouth is a lie. That, uh, that's just for sure. That's not, that's not a sometimes maybe, that's, that's a for sure. And twice when you were out here by yourself, you just said, you know, honestly, and then you ran some stuff about not knowing what was going on with your phone. Hey, look, honestly, I don't remember making this account. Did somebody slip up and write stupid on my forehead? <laughs> well. And when you're telling me what's happening, you're shaking your head no the because whole time. There's so much to this that you guys are not even looking at. Well, I there's a way out of this maze. That it looks <coughs> as though I've done this. Oh, I understand. I get that. And let me tell you something else that I know, and uh, and understand. Hear me now, when I tell you this. I, I've been involved in interrogations with criminals, and you're certainly not a criminal. I have never had someone confess that didn't really do it. You see on TV where you say, well, it was like life in prison or take a deal and confess that you did it. I understand my love for Billy. Um, oh, I know. You're the exception in 40 years. Is that what you're telling me? People don't confess to crimes they don't commit. They don't stand up in front of a judge and say, yes, I hacked her to death, so I'll only spend 10 years in prison instead of 40. People don't confess to crimes they don't commit. They, they do on TV. I have a TV show on, on uh, it's called Bull. It's about crime and crime detection. But I in real life, people again. don't confess. I would go through that. You think I'm That's a good show. But that's the problem. You think I'm playing about this. You, you, because, I know you did because this. Because You're all, so because, busy trying to make sure minute. you have him. All of you, the, you're so the You're so busy trying to make sure you still have him on the line that it's you're just ignoring me. I'm not ignoring you. I'm I would if I were you. But at the same time, like, <laughs> I know what the, I know that all the evidence, like, points. That's the whole reason I came, Dr. Phil, was to, for your help. I needed your help. To You're prove getting it. That I didn't do this. Everything points to me. There, I get there that. Maybe four I understand or five things that. that she may not really but there are feel that she gets upset about. But the rest of the stuff, I believe she has done. There's so much from the, the beginning of this. Okay, Billy, I said that um, yes. I had a really watershed question for you. I know. I don't know what it is, but okay. What would she have to do in order for you to say enough's enough and too much is too much? What would she have to do? I mean, I'm about to that point. Because That's... here's what you know: you you know that she slept with another man uh, on two occasions. This she said it wasn't her fault. Uh, she, you know all of this for sure. I just tell that hope because and, she's who I really love. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait
I'm, I'm, I'm done. The girls need a different role model than oh, what they've wait, had. Wait, wait, wait a minute. You act as though, I'm sorry, excuse me. You act as though I'm a bad role model. Wait a minute. I'm, I'm talking to him. Don't I'm not saying a me. bad role model. I'm just talking about as no, far as the house talk getting to me. clean. I mean, I've had to pay uh, somebody to come in and clean the house four times. She's a stay-at-home mom. Only responsibility she has, Dr. Phil, is the house and the kids. Bills, nothing else. Just the house and the kids. And she can't even do that, Dr. Phil. I can't even do that. I wonder why. Because I'm too busy looking I'm at your depressed. phone. I'm sorry you're depressed. All right, let me ask you, what is it you're looking for on that phone? What are you going to find that is, you're going to say, okay, there's nothing the, here's the find. silver bullet. Nothing here's, this, is what I, this is what I needed to see there's nothing. to know not what anything. I needed to know. What is it you're going to find not, that you don't already know? There's not anything I don't already know. Are you going to find that she's, that she's having just, sex with somebody? I just don't know what their other Put phone the list numbers were for. I just don't know what those numbers were for, and I don't know... Okay, Why but she's doing what it. is it you're going to find? That she's talking to other men? I Hell, you, you already know uh, that. It's true. You, you're no, gonna, it is you're, not. you're going to find it, that she was, she's going to dating? So you already know that. You, you're going to find what? What are you going to find that you don't already know? I'm trying to figure out why. What would be worth her causing all this damage to our family for That's what? That's another question. The other question is not if. The other question is why. And, uh, and I can tell you, I, I know what she's doing. I just don't know why. I, I want to spend time on why, but I can't get to why because she wants to argue the if. Excuse me, I have to stop this. I didn't come to this show to be made fun of. Dr. Phil, from the beginning of this, I can tell you I did not do any of this. And later, stop lying to your husband. He will stop manipulating your children. Because if I see another tape like that, I'm turning you into Child Protective Services. Because that is abuse. Do I think she's doing every single thing that she's accused of? No. Doctor. But there's no question in my mind that she's lying to me and she's lying to you. No question, if you think I know what I'm doing even a little bit, she is not telling me the truth, she is not telling you the truth. She's telling you some truth, she's telling you half truths, and you know, we're from the same part of the country, that old saying, for every rat you see, there's 50 you don't. That's what you think you know. Just think of the you don't know. That's what I'm worried about. <laughs> you have no idea how this is so. Wait a minute, this is not even... Yeah. So my question to you is, is that if there's no point, it was no matter what she does, it's not going to make any difference, then why home. look? Because you already know everything you're looking for, and because if I that's okay quit, with you... give me consistency that she'll chill out and quit doing stuff. I bought her a flip phone, Dr. Phil, so she'd stay out there in that. Little did I know you can put you in a five-digit code on this flip phone. You can build fences. You. You, can, you did volunteer it, but you, you broke can, it as soon as I went to show you how it went on the internet. You can build fences horse high and pig tight, and they can still get out. Yes. You cannot build a fence you, you high enough or deep enough around her that she can't get out if she wants out. And do you want the kind of relationship where you have to do that? You have really? to tether her? Yup. You understand where I'm at with this. Dr. Listen, you, you can you put a worm in his ear later. I'm talking to him right now. I understand. What, what is enough? This is not I've enough. had enough, but I just don't know how. Bill, you know. I just haven't brought myself to actually leave her. I don't know, Dr. I, Phil. I'm not saying that you should leave her. I'm just saying you need to quit lying to yourself. Excuse me. I have to stop this. I'm sorry. This is not right. I have to stop because... Dr. Phil, from the beginning of this, I can tell you I did not do any of this. Dr. Phil, I can tell you from the beginning she did do it because there's no way in hell that anybody is going to get that her phone and change an email address on the account. They don't even know I looked at everyone, on a phone that... Anyone and everyone that could take and grab a hold of this and help me with this and prove my innocence Everybody on this. believed her until I talked to him, and as soon as I was done telling my side, then nobody believed well, what the heck she was I saying. Mean, there's so much to this story that... There really Do isn't. Yes, no, there no. is. <laughs> there really is. Why else would I go and and reach out? I mean, Dr. Phil. We got the Russians involved here, for God's sake. <laughs> Wait a minute. I, I, I even made the statement that I didn't Look. feel... Billy knew even when we went through this, he said, Jennifer, everything's coming up through 
Russia or Germany. This isn't, um, there's, there's so much to this. There, there really isn't. There is. No, there really isn't. What there is happening is here when is. When you he, honestly believe that I come to this show, I didn't come to this show to be put on national TV to be made fun of. I came on national TV because somebody needs to know what I'm going <clears throat> through is absolutely something that anybody could go through. You're, going through, the, you're upset. That, I'm look, talking about the fact that. You're upset that I don't a, believe you. I, I am. Nobody believes you. I'm sorry. I'm I just don't believe I, you. you. You have not persuaded I, me. I, I'm, I'm sorry. What do you want me to do? Tell you that I believe you when I don't? No. Yes. No, I don't. I, 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 I don't but believe you. I asked you, have you told, have is, really is everything you've told to, me the truth? It you is said the truth. yes. That's just simply not true. It is the truth. Everything that I've told you has been the truth. I don't believe you. And you don't believe you, you may not like me, but I, and, and I, I think you're a great man. You, you may not, <laughs> you, you may not like what I'm saying or doing, but you're not going to leave here and say, "Well, pull the wool over his eyes," because you and but I both know you have I'm not told me to the do. truth here yes, I fully have. and completely. You then have tell not. Tell him what you told him in the confessions. Tell him the truth. Give him something. The confessions say yes, I. Uh, the, but you didn't do any of it. Is what you're saying now, Billy. That's the whole reason well, I came to the show. Why did I go through the 17 months? That is the whole reason I came to this show. I thought we came to the show because you were going to finally confess and tell me what the hell was going the on. Obviously not. Months, so we came here for Dr. nothing. Phil, for the first four and a half months, he didn't believe a word I said. I still don't. Really? It's been like that, Jen. I this found out more and more like, and more each time we went on, and you've lied about more and more. Let me tell you what happened here. You had a very short term affair with somebody. He heard somebody tell him that you were thinking about running off with him. So he got suspicious, looked at your phone, saw something that he didn't like. So he went to bed, and you deleted it. And from there, this started snowballing downhill. And you started covering your tracks because you found out that there was a whole lot more on that phone that than he knew I about, and you've been dumping forensics. it right and left ever since then. That's why I wanted a full forensic. Just what they pulled up, Jenny, proves a lot. I asked for a full they pulled forensic, off. Dr. Phil, because I know without a doubt in my mind that if I have a full forensics done on that phone, I can guarantee that that will prove I did not do this. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, we have a very sophisticated IT department here. They looked at everything and agree 100% with your private investigators. I'm not done with this. I am. I'm not living like this, Jen. I can't. Shame on you. Make it stop. I don't know how. Well, you better figure it out. Well, Jennifer and Billy's young daughters are the ones paying the price for their parents' obsession over this, this no hacking mystery. You need to pay attention to this. There's been so much fighting that Billy wanted a divorce. So here's how Jennifer responded. I love you, Daddy. So does she. So does she. And so do I. We all love you. And we all need you. We all want you. Bree, do you believe we can be a happy family? Uh -huh. huh? Yeah. Do you believe that mommy and daddy together are, uh -huh. are what's best for you? Yes. Do you believe that for Brooklyn too? Do you believe that mom can uh -huh. and is and will be a good mom? Uh -huh. hey, I love you. I I'm not signing those papers. Shame on you. Let me just say, the reason oh, that, that was done was because he has involved her from the get-go on a daily basis with this. He has involved her asking, hey, has 
mommy, uh, she, has she been on her phone today? What has she been doing but on her phone? How long has she been on her phone I quit today? talking to Jennifer about anything. But Swoop her up and say, here, because mommy is having a bad moment with you. Why? Why did I do all that time? Why did I feel more like a referee than a dad and a father and a husband? You know why I had a hard time. I understand you had a hard time. I had to give him enough love for me and you both, plus be a referee between you and her. And then when I do get to enjoy it, all this crap starts, so you get my attention, whether it's negative or positive, just so she oh, doesn't yes, get I it. I just asked for this. <clears throat> well, I just stop asked it. To I didn't Make ask it stop. for it. Make it stop. I don't know how. Well, you better figure it out. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Isn't it true that you're in so deep now you don't know how to get out? That I'm in so deep that I don't know how to get out. Yeah, in a sense, because I've told him yes, no, yes, no. And how do I, how do I get him back to realizing what's, what's really been? Honesty, consistency. All you had to do is unplug. Well, and uh, we have talked about that. I'm not going to plug it. I'm but not going to phone. He won't. You can give him your phone all you want. I'm not going to give him my phone. I shouldn't have to. I'm married to a 35-year-old woman, 36 now. Babe, I shouldn't have to worry I about a phone and a two-year-old at home. Billy, you don't. And yes, you I do, and that. I do every day. I need you to listen to me. Somebody is in our stuff. They're doing Every time I listen to you, you lied to me. How would I listen to you then? He didn't want to believe Look, that this, this was even so possible. Look, this is so simple to solve. And lying. you're telling me all I'm of this. I'm not lying to you. Then why haven't you just solved the problem? That's the. That's the, what I'm trying to say. Is if I knew how to solve this, I would no, have no, already, already told me you solved. Know how to solve it. Okay, just get a phone in somebody else's name. Honestly, I have thought about dropping off of the face of the earth, and I told no, Billy. No, answer I my said, question. Why, why just... not get a phone in somebody else's name? I have. If, and, and then, uh, unless, unless this hacker. Unless they're actually following you around your town into the diner and know who got a phone in their name for you, there's no way they can hack you. This is a lot bigger than that, Dr. Phil. Because then all the drama goes away, all the, all, all the ability to, to be caught up in all of this I'm goes away. I'm ready to get back to if our you normal just lives. Have, if, 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 if I just gave you my phone and you used it for the rest of your life and nobody knew that was the number you had, then how would they ever hack you? How would they know? Because they come through anything, anything that, is, that has a circuit. I... Oh, they're going to come through the wiring in the house or something? What are you saying? <laughs> what are you saying? The DVD player just now worked. No, what are you saying? Because they are capable of coming through the uh, anything that is Wi-Fi, anything that has any type of uh, circuit, any, it, they can come through by sound waves, by keystrokes. They can come through. There's a number of ways, and I know this. Okay, I think I understand for the first time. What should Billy do now? I'm going to tell both of them what I think needs to happen after the break. She's constantly, constantly crying. <laughs> and there's no tears. Jeffrey has a lot of crocodile tears. <laughs> At the break, Billy was saying to Jennifer, um, I just don't believe you're not doing it. Billy, there is no it. There is no hacking. There is no tampering. There is none of this. When I say, let's just get a phone in somebody else's name and, and you use it and then nobody I even knows, then you say, well, they can come through your keystrokes. They can come through all of this. You, you're now just talking nonsense. No, I, I'm, I'm... And... Um, really? You're, you're, you studied all of it. Billy, what are you voice. asking Billy? Honestly, there was a lot that I learned. Honestly. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's I don't a, think it's something she okay, didn't already listen, know. It's just okay, a way to cover listen, her butt. It's a habit. It's a word I'm telling that is you, a habit. I'm, I'm telling you the solution is 
everything that you now have, it just goes away and you just get something that's not even in your name and whoever's hacking can't know that. And y your problem is solved. We even had a different telephone number to uh, the flip phone and they were still able to... She was still able to. Billy, come on. Jennifer, it's true. Me? No, I'm not kidding you. Everybody believes you're doing this and there's not no, one... No, there are... Name no. one person. It's very clear to me, you don't want to solve the problem. We've I've talked to IT experts and you can say, we've done it, we've done it, we've done it. Then you are the one exception on the face of the globe that is so important that all of the forces in the cyber world have focused their energies on you. And if that's what you believe, then I can't help you. But if you want to solve the problem, you will do what I'm telling you, yes. and you will stop lying to your husband about anything else, and you will stop manipulating your children. Because if I see another tape like that, I'm turning you into Child Protective Services, because that is abuse. That is abuse. Now you can argue with him about who did what to who, but I have video evidence of abusing that child. And if that happens again, I'm turning you in. Do you understand? Absolutely. Do you understand? That child will be out of there in a heartbeat if you do that again. You need to have that clear. There ain't no hack in that. I'm telling you straight up right here. You know what you know. And if you want to hit the reset button and get a new set of devices and start this and see if you can trust her, that's fine. She has not been forthcoming here today, in my opinion. You are gullible. If, if you believe that all of this is going on, I, I, you know what you know, if that's not discontinuation criteria, then okay. God be with you, be happy, and do whatever you want to do. If you want help working this out, I will provide it for you. But, you know, if, if you want to continue this fiction, no. then there's no point in getting help because you're going to continue this fiction. She thinks she's smart enough to manipulate everybody and still stay in the marriage. I, I tried to get you to be transparent here so I could help and rebuild this and make this okay. It's your last chance, Jennifer. You I better get know. busy. Wait, wait. You better get talking. First of all, I don't know how to be any more transparent than what I've been. Are you serious? Um, you can't tell, don't tell everything you told me in your confession because the last confession you made was true. And you can't say it wasn't, Jennifer Nicole, because that was some of the stuff on the list that you didn't deny. So you better get to talking to him and talk to him right. That ship has sailed. I'm sorry. You had an opportunity and you blew it. Stop. If you're gonna do what we did out there, I don't have time to do that again. If you have something new to say to me, then let's do it. So nothing new to say? Yes. Talk to me. I'd love to talk with you. If you want to do what you've been doing out there, there's no point in us just doing it again. Dr. Phil, I came on this show because when... No, stop. If you're going to do what we did out there, I don't have time to do that again. If you have something new to say to me, then let's do it. But if you're just going to give me the same line you've given, given me out there, we, we are... I, I don't want to... We already have that. So nothing new to say? Yes. With this back and forth, okay, with Billy, it got to where if I said I did this, okay, then he would go, well, you must have done this. And he'd just keep on and keep on and keep on. And Dr. Phil, I never knew where to quit. Jennifer. And so I, I tried to I do know that everything. you're the one that's doing this. I just don't know why. Dr. I, I just Phil, want to know why. But that's the problem, Dr. Phil, is I'm not. When you start telling me, though, they get in through your keystrokes. They do. Come on. Do you think I'm an idiot? No, I don't think you're an idiot. I just don't think that you are educated on that. Yeah. The way. Okay. No, I don't mean it in a bad form, Dr. Phil. I didn't. Jennifer, you dumped the account during the night. Did you or did you not? No, I did not. Okay, then we're Dr. done. Dr. Phil, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to take 
a lie detector no, test. No, you're not. I am. You took one and you said you'd give it to us and you didn't. I am. I didn't know when we took this over a year ago that I would need the written you report. You told us you would give it to us and you didn't. I didn't understand that we would need a written report. Yeah, well, he's getting ready to dump you. I understand this. But I also understand that that is why I came to you, Dr. Phil. So what are you saying? What are you saying? Because I, I don't saying, believe you, that I'm not helping you. I don't believe you. I am saying that I know. You're not telling you, me the truth. I am telling you the truth. Well. Dr. Phil, I'm telling you the don't truth. Don't believe you. I came here because I needed your help. This can stop today. I'm ready for and that. And then it's just you and Billy. I'm ready. I'm beyond ready. Our baby. Oh, well, when I said it, I said, oh, well, no, they can still get in through the keystrokes. They can get in through the Wi-Fi. They can get in because you're so important that they're going I to bring all of their cyber power to your little town and get into you. I That starts to ready. sound really delusional. I'm ready for this to stop. And I'll get you guys a good, uh, uh, have you ever heard of Doctor on Demand? No. Doctor on Demand is a huge national company that is computer based out of the Silicon Valley. Okay. It's owned by me and my son Jay. It's the biggest telemedicine company in the world. And you download an app to your phone and in a matter of like two or three minutes, you can be face to face with a board certified and licensed physician. If you're sick, they can call in prescriptions, they can order lab work, you don't have to get dressed, go to the doctor's office, anything. And they also provide psychological services. So you're in front of a licensed PhD level therapist right there in your own home. You and Billy can sit there in front of a screen and there that person is that can work with you on the marriage and come up with a plan for you guys to embrace to move forward. And I am willing to provide that to the two of you starting immediately if you set this up where there is no hacker excuse. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. All right. I hope he's willing. I will recommend him to do it. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'll talk to him. We'll see you. <laughs> Jennifer just kept up the nonsense. My next move will be getting a divorce because I want a happy family. It's easier for me to move on because Jennifer won't give me closure. It'll be easier getting over her than trying to figure out the situation because I don't have the time or energy. I knew Dr. Phil would see through it. I just was hoping Jennifer would tell Dr. Phil the truth. I don't know what made her change or turn into this person, but I can't live with her. Well, on the way to the airport, Jennifer fessed up in the car. Here's what she had to say. I did. I did hack into Billy's Apple ID. I was able to hack into his device and I was able to see everything he did. I was able to change it. I was able to do all sorts of things. I had a very strong feeling all along that she was lying, but I decided to bring Jennifer and Billy back so I could look her in the eye one last time because I wanted to see if she was really telling Billy something that was true or if this was another version of the truth. Here's what happened. You're back. I am sorry. I lied to you. So you lied about what? I got into his accounts with his passwords and would be able to use other devices to do it. Was there a hacker or were you the hacker? Yes, I was the hacker. So to be clear, there was no hacker, just you. So do you see why I kept saying, I don't believe her? Yes. Now, do you believe me? Yes. I am sorry, I Dr. Phil. I'm sorry. 
I am sorry. I apologize to you and to all of your crew. I accept your apology and I hope you put this behind you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay? Yes. All right. You. Take care. If you at home want to have your own Doctor on Demand, go to Google Play Store or iTunes App Store and download the Doctor on Demand app. Uh, it's great. You won't believe how well it works. I want to thank all of my guests today. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you.